Okie doke. Andra videon i den... Oh, sorry, wrong language. <laughs> Second video in the first set. The introduction to the course. And this second one, it's just going to be a few words on economics in general and macroeconomics in particular. Okay. And a little bit also specifically linking to the course. We'll see. Another very short video, this one. So let's assume we're interested in the management of the economy, which we typically are as a macro economist. So what sort of questions might we ask ourselves? Well, an engineer might ask themselves, what is feasible? What can we, what can we do? What's possible? A philosopher might ask themselves, like, what is desirable? What's the right thing to do, perhaps? The economist typically asks themselves, what is optimal according to some criterion? which is essentially sort of philosophically grounded, actually, that criterion. But then we build a model and say, OK, what's the optimal thing to do in this model? And then from the model, we try to draw conclusions about what the right thing or the optimal thing to do is in the real economy. And what is how do we work out what is optimal? Typically, we use a so-called utilitarian reasoning. We say we want to maximize utility, which is the sum of utility across households H. So maximize the sum of U H across the households H. And household utility U H is the sum over time of that household's utility at each point in time discount it. So <laughs> let me try out my, my plan here. So we've got UH is sigma the sum over time of little UH of CT times beta to the T. That is a beta, as I'm sure you all know. So C here is consumption. So we're saying that the instantaneous utility of the household H is a function of its consumption of goods. And the overall utility, overall future, is the sum of these instantaneous utilities across all future periods. So we're in discrete time here. We could have done it in continuous time too. And what's this beta? Beta is the discount factor, and it's less than one. Because so when t is naught, that's the current period. Beta to the naught is just one. So then we've got full value for our utility. But if t is one, then say if beta is 0.9, then we the that first the period one away is weighted lower right and if t is two we get beta squared that's even lower so we're giving lower weight to future periods this is the classic thing we tend to do in economics but of course we don't have to do it that way we could also apply rules maximin criterion rules so the utilitarianism is a stream in philosophy there's also this Rawlsian idea that we should maximize whoops, whatever is in these brackets. So this is mathematical notation. And what is in those brackets? We should maximize the, lead, the smallest element of whatever is in these brackets. And what's in these brackets? U1, U2, Un. We've got individual utility levels of the N different households. Okay, so this is a super egalitarian. We want to make sure that the worst off household is as well off as possible. Of 
according to rules that is how that is the sort of moral principle we should use to try to organize society so that's like super egalitarian and you can do economics with this criterion as well and it is sometimes done but the, the utilitarian dominates hugely okay okay so we've made we've got our criterion now we're going to start doing some economics what are we going to do the classic approach is this you start by building a model of the economic system everything a mathematical model so you know and you can work out exactly how it works and from given starting point with given rules of behavior you can work out exactly what's going to happen over time and so on and you find the allocation of resources in the broad sense which means labor capital natural resources given laissez-faire in other words assuming that there's no regulation whatsoever or under business as usual which is you have the policy you you have some policy instruments that are roughly like we see in the real economy you're trying to model you're trying to sort of um capture capture with your economic model okay so you have, that's your baseline typically the laissez faire but then you assume okay let's forget the market and so on so laissez faire is when the market is operating right but then you can say okay if we just forget the market and let's assume there's a social planner who can just tell everybody what to do and the social planner is benevolent so the social planner wants the best outcome for everybody according to whatever our criterion was what would that socially social planner do if we can find the answer to that question then we know the socially optimal allocation of resources and if we've done that number two then the next step number three is to find policy instruments that can move the economy from the laissez-faire allocation towards the planner's allocation so say in laissez-faire we're burning loads of fossil fuels and we're causing all sorts of pollution problems including climate change but then we look at how a benevolent social planner would do work run things and we could say perhaps the planner would leave all the fossil fuels in the ground and use solar power and other things instead so assume we found that in stage two in stage three the question will be okay so what are the right policy instruments to get people to use solar power instead of fossil fuels or maybe the first step might be to invest hugely in research into solar power and then switch to solar power to actually using it so then again then the policy question will be okay how do we persuade people to do all this research what are the policy instruments okay so this is the classic approach to sort of macroeconomics and in the model we're going to do a lot of number one just trying to understand how the economy works we're not going to talk so much about two the social planners solution we're more gonna focus on three finding policy instruments we're going to sort of assume that the planner wants to push the economy in a certain direction say away from fossil fuels and then we're going to look at okay what are the policy instruments that can achieve this but we're not going to spend very much time at all looking at what the social planners actual uh, um, allocation of resources would be exactly in our models okay we're going to focus mainly on understanding the system one and understanding how we can affect it through policy three we'll talk a bit about optimal allocations too as well but not so much okay so we've built a model we've worked out say even the planner's solution we've worked out the policy implications in the model but is this teaching us anything about the real world can we then say okay this is what happens in the model but these are the policy policies we should use in the model therefore we should also use them in the real world is that true 
Not necessarily, right? How do we know when we have a good model? And this is super important part of the course, okay? So we're not just gonna be putting up models uncritically and saying, you know, this is what the model shows us and therefore we should be using these policies. We're gonna be saying like, does this model really teach us anything about what we should do in the real world? Okay, so how can we think about this? Consider the following aggregate production function. Let's see, one of these worked and the other one didn't. I think it was this one. So the function is y is all to the one minus beta arr to the beta. So this is a Cobb-Douglas function. So what are these things? L is labor. R is some natural resource. And these are productivity indices. They're productivities. OK. Right. And Y is overall production. And I'm not going to go through the math of how this works, but assuming perfect markets, this model predicts that the factor share of the natural resource, which is WRR over Y. So Y is the value of everything we produce. WR is the price of the resource and R is the quantity. So this is what we spend on the resource. So the factor share of the resource is what we spend on the resource as a as a fraction of the total value of production. And if we go through the math, that assuming perfect markets and so on, we should find this, that the factor share of the resource is beta. And I say, assuming this matches, assume this matches long run data. And it does, more or less. Note, this is a different beta than that beta. Yeah, this isn't the discount factor anymore. And it turns out that factor share is about 0.05%. So we spend about 5%. Firms on average spend about 5% of their input costs are on natural resources, which is mainly for energy. And that is quite constant. It fluctuates, but on the, the trend is there's hardly any trend, okay? In the very long run, it tends to be around 5%. Like 100 years ago, it was around 5%. Today, it's around 5%. It's fluctuating in between, but there's no trend. And that tallies with this basic idea for the production function. Does that prove that this is this production function is correct? Does it show that we can use a model based on this production function as a basis for policy? It doesn't at all, right? There could be loads of other production functions that were also more or less consistent with this observation. Okay, but which would have very different policy implications. So just because we build some model that fits some particular data that we choose to pull out of the hat, so to speak, doesn't tell us that we can then rely on that model for designing policy in the real economy. Okay. What we need for to design policy is a model that we actually believe in. <laughs> and, when do we really believe in our model? It's not just that it's matching what's one particular set of data. We want its assumptions, the mechanisms in the model. We want to be confident that those mechanisms are actually reflecting in some simplified way, of course, it's a model, but they are reflecting what's going on in the real economy. So for that, we want 
micro foundations. This is the Lucas critique. This was the debate from the 70s and 80s that macro models should have micro foundations and those micro foundations should be credible. So they should build up from the behavior of individual agents in the economy, households and firms with incentives. How are they behaving and how does this lead to the aggregate uh, behavior we observe in the whole economy? So we should start with assumptions about the micro foundations in the model and we should explain why those assumptions make sense. Then we should derive the behavior economy and see if it fits a broad range of data, not just one particular data series. If, if we can tick all those boxes, then we can start thinking about, okay, maybe this model is really telling us something useful. Okay. How do we know if we have a good model? So I told you now, but we're gonna talk about this uh, in our first meeting, okay. And I think that's the end of the second video.